My name is Carolyn Kim. I teach here at Biola in the Public Relations Department, and I've just been on this campus for two years. I came out of the PR industry, and my specialty was digital media. So I did a lot with SEO, with website design and user paths, with social media especially. And I continue to do that in my consulting. And one of the biggest platforms, which is why we're here, is Pinterest. It's kind of up and rising. So before we get going, there's a broad range of knowledge about Pinterest right now because it's so new. It's three years old, essentially. So we're just going to take a quick quiz. I'm not going to ask you to tell me your answer, but it'll kind of gauge for you where you're at. There's three phases that I'm kind of measuring, either kind of like newbie phase or kind of pin cushion phase, trying to get you know good with Pinterest, and then pinning pro. So for the first one, phase one, do you have a Pinterest account? I talk to a lot of people and they're very interested, but they don't have an account yet. So if you have an account, good. Do you know what repinning is? And we'll go over that, but if you do, you're going well. What a board is, and do you use Pinterest at least once a week? If you meet all those things, then you are good to go. You're past the newbie phase, which takes you to phase two. So do you manage a Pinterest board? There are now business boards available. It's not just personal profiles. And so that's kind of the next level. This talk is about doubling your engagement and measuring your ROI. And that's really from your organizational standpoint. So if you manage a board, you're doing well. And do you have Pinterest integrated with your website or with a mobile app? That's kind of the next level you want to get to, not just having a Pinterest place, but really having it part of your strategy, having it something you're intentional about. Do you have a structure to your board creation, or is it kind of more, hey, that's a great idea, let's start a board? Do you utilize strategy for pinning others' content and creating user engagement? If you do all of those things, then you're in the high level of pinning pro. Most people, I would say, at this point are usually in this section. Pinterest is fairly new. They've recently rolled out the business pages. So a lot of people are still kind of in phase two. But if you're there and you're moving ahead, then phase three would be questions such as, are you using rich pens on behalf of your organization or ministry? Do you monitor those? And do you look at the repins and the reach and the breadth of where you're going? Pinterest, up until recently, March, had no integrated analytic system, but now they do. So organizations and people who really want to be strategic, who want to know what the value of their Pinterest presence is, are measuring. Do you design pinning strategies to orchestrate a design behind what someone's going to experience? And then do you create content specifically for Pinterest usage? So it's not just repurposing something that's already on your website. It's saying, we want to make Pinterest a hub for our engagement. So we're going to make something that we put on our blog or on our homepage that's uniquely designed to be pinnable content with the hopes of seeing it repinned. That's phase three. By the end of this, I'm hoping that there's takeaways, no matter which phase you're in. So we're going to have some takeaways at the very end. Bear with me as we kind of go through everything, because I think there is a little bit of diversity for where people are at. My goal with starting is to give you some of the facts about Pinterest, to explain why it's even worth talking about, and two stats that should stand out in your mind if you're someone coming at it from an organizational perspective is 80 and 70. 70% 70 of the content on Pinterest is user generated. It is not generated by brands or organizations or ministries. It's all generated by the people. And 80% of the content that is on pinning is repinned. So out of all the pins that people do, 80% of those are repins. It's not a new pin. So 80, 70, really important figures for organizations. But there's also some other facts that you should be aware of. For example, last year it was measured that Pinterest surpassed Yahoo as the fourth driver of traffic on the internet. That is significant to me as a PR person as I look at it because when individuals ask me, should we be on Pinterest, and I see that Pinterest is driving huge amount of users towards organizations, the answer is absolutely yes, you want to be there. Another interesting fact is that they recently rolled out searchable pins. So if you're a Pinterest person and you're always trying to find that one pin that you liked, now Pinterest has it so you can type it in the search bar. Again, great user fact, but as an organization, that tells me that they've moved to the next phase of searching content. So whatever your organization is about, you should be making your pins searchable for people who are looking for exactly your content. Another interesting fact, since it's 70% user-driven, 
I like to think of Pinterest as the most user-generated social media platform. Most of the content, it's a very mass public content, and you're seeing a lot of unique users on there. We'll talk about the users in a minute. But that kind of gives you an idea. Pinterest is a place that's driven by users, not brands. It's a place where people spend less time than Facebook. I've seen a lot of different statistics. Some people say 16 minutes, some people say 90 minutes. On average, your user is spending about 15 minutes at a time on Pinterest, but they're probably going back fairly often. You're gonna have a lot of people repinning. There's not as much, hey, let me comment on your photo. That's not what Pinterest is about, though it does happen. So if you're looking at that as your measurement, you're gonna be a little disappointed, I think. And it has about, in February, they said they had 25 million users. That's compared to 200 million active users on Twitter, which is the second largest, and then Facebook with its 1.1 billion users. But this morning I was checking and someone estimated almost 50 million now. So it's ramping up quickly is what that's telling you. In the past 12 months, Pinterest has changed radically and increased users. It was the fastest social media network to break 10 million unique monthly users, faster than anyone before. So I think you're seeing the wave of the future when you look at this site. Yes? Do you know um, any of the stats about like, women versus men? Yes. You read my mind. Get to it. Yeah, no, that's perfect. So let's talk about that. The users are a very unique thing because when anyone says, I want to be on Pinterest, I want to make sure that Pinterest reaches who they're trying to reach. So let me tell you who Pinterest is. Pinterest is about 97% women right now. And the main age group is 24 to 35. So you're seeing kind of late college grads, stay at home moms a lot of times on Pinterest. Now, Retailers are actually really excited about this because they see that women are the driving powers of money, really. They're making the buying decisions. And that also leads into what we'll talk about in a minute, some of the main boards, some of the main type of content that is shared. But it is, it's a heavily female-based platform, typically 24 to 35, you're gonna see the majority of your people. I would say that's probably gonna change. You're starting to see different people on there. There's the director of social media for the NFL talks about social media is an experience. That's what you're creating. You're not creating interaction or sending information, you're creating an experience. And people are starting to do that on Pinterest. And I think as that takes force, you're going to see the demographics change. It is primarily visual based, which is a big thing. It kind of competes a little bit with like Instagram for visuals. Instagram has more of the male demographic, but Pinterest has some unique things happening now with it where you pin it and it can take you to another place. It can have sharing mechanisms, so it has more robust features, and I think you'll just continue to see those demographics, I hope, equal out. I think so. Ultimately, what you should be thinking about is your brand community. Every church, every educational institution, every organization has a brand community, and the thing that public relations people talk about, the things that marketers talk about, is that brand communities are no longer geographically oriented. That's not what makes a brand community. What makes a brand community is coming around an idea or a concept or a vision or a passion, and people are unified around that and around your organization that embodies that. So your brand community is a group of people who hopefully are really excited about what you're doing and they want to talk about it and they want to participate in it and they find value in their lives because of what you contribute. And that's really key for Pinterest. It's giving the user value. And that's because, again, 70% of the content is user-driven. So unless your users are excited about what you have and what you're providing, you're not going to see your pins taking off and you're not going to see that engagement. Pinterest, I think above any other platform, is one where you cannot just broadcast. Social media in general does not lend itself to that, but Pinterest especially. You can have a board and you can put tons of pins out there and it will mean nothing for your organization or brand unless your brand community is exciting and talking about what you're doing. So here, it's kind of hard to see. It's by Unmetric, so if anyone wants to know the source, I did not make this infographic, but it's kind of outlining some of the top things people talk about. And I think that's important to look at when you're trying to understand what drives Pinterest. Right now, the biggest thing people like to pin and talk about are homes. That's really big because people are dreaming on Pinterest. They want to create their new kitchen. They're looking at buying a house. They're recreating a kid's room. All of these things are their opportunity to be excited, to connect it with their lives in a tangible way, and not to feel sold. 
Pinterest is not marketing. Pinterest is about creating experience. It's about a relationship. So these people can do that because it relates to their life. The second two categories after homes are recipes and food. If you have ever been on Pinterest, you see a ton of recipes. And now there's this whole wave of people who are making Pinterest boards with pictures of what they tried to make from Pinterest and like doing the before and after. It's because food is a big part of what people are experiencing and they don't feel sold. Again, they see something, they say, you know, that's great, that interacts with my life. I was at a Mommy Blogger, Bloggers event and one of them was talking about creating infographics and what takes off and she said, her client was an apple juice maker. They really wanted to be able to get that out to moms. And so what she did is she created an infographic on how to do a gluten-free lunch for your kid. And that became one of her most pinned content ever. It was very simple, very straightforward. People liked that. They got their information easily, quickly, and it wasn't a sales pitch. It was, here's how it can help out your life. That's what Pinterest is about, that brand community where people get excited. So there's a whole lot of concepts that are encompassed in all of those facts that I kind of want to unpack for the rest of this session. Value. Value, first and foremost, is going to be the cornerstone of any social media platform. But particularly on Pinterest, you have to ask yourself, what is the value of what I'm providing to my brand community? Because if they aren't excited, if it's not going to relate to their life, if it's not something they want to share, there's really no reason to put it on Pinterest. It just becomes a dead board or a dead pin. You want to think, what ignites conversation? What about your church or your academic institution or your organization is the thing that people talk about, that people get excited for? And then, how can you make that visual and help share it with them? That's what you want to ask yourself. That creates values. And that leads into images. Pinterest is about images. One of the hardest things for me is when I see people trying to get on Pinterest and I get that they recognize it's a powerful medium, it's a platform, you can take it places, but it's like a headline for a blog. They just did a pin from their blog and it, there's no visual element, it's a bunch of text crammed into a small area. That's not Pinterest. Pinterest is image-based and images can capture a lot in a very short period of time. That's why infographics have taken off so well. But you'll notice the best people on Pinterest use infographics, but they design them so that the top section, when it becomes that thumbnail, is easy to see, you can easily tell what it is, and it pins very well. So images are a big part of Pinterest. You can't just kind of haphazardly do it, you have to be intentional. Order. One of the questions we asked in the beginning to figure out where people were with their Pinterest strategy was, do you have a design to your boards? People are kind of in two camps. Some say never delete a board because you're going to lose followers. And I can definitely understand that. But I also think you need to be very intentional with the boards you create. You want people, if they do come and they follow your Pinterest account, to understand the categories that they're getting involved with, to understand where they're going to be excited, where they're going to want to follow, and what you're really talking about. Pinterest doesn't let you talk about everything. It's not the place to talk about everything. So you want to show that you know what you're talking about, that it's valuable to them, and that they would be excited to follow and be part of that. So when you name your boards, think about that. And again, since they just rolled out that search feature, you want to use phrases and words that people would probably use when they go to Pinterest for the first time and start looking. So educational resources or ministry resources. I have a Pinterest board and it's kind of eclectic because I have my consulting and I have my own life where I kind of want to have something about me and I have public relations education. So when I put it together, I create boards that have PR education. That's the name of one of my boards so that I can reach out to other professionals in education. I have just public relations because if I'm working with my people that I consult with, they're not coming to me for education, not like a student. They're coming to me to understand the world of PR. I have one that's just dedicated to social media because some people don't associate public relations with social media, so I want to capture them. I have my cooking, I have my styles, and part of the reason I did extra boards like that is because I wanted to create engagement. I know that people repin cooking recipes, and I know I'm not the best cook, so I'm going to start something like that so I can repin from other people, I can create engagement, and then they're gonna be opened up to my other boards. They're gonna see what I do. So you wanna be strategic. Always think about your audience. You can't do anything in social media without considering your audience, and I think that's the number one downfall for people. Everyone knows social media is big, so people tend to jump on board and get into social media, but when you don't consider your audience, your social media becomes a moot point. 
It's like going to a party but having no intention of knowing who's going to be there. So when you look at your audience, if you're on Pinterest, you're thinking it is primarily women. It is primarily 24 to 35. There are the outliers, and I think you will continue to see that shift. But when you first get on there, what about that demographic is going to meet your needs? Is that your demographic? If it's not, are you going to be able to pull your demographic in? If you are working with high school and college students, they're not the primary market right now, but there are a lot of them on Pinterest, and it's a growing wave. So maybe you have to be extra intentional about how you articulate it. If your primary outreach is to men, then you have to really create graphics that are helpful to men and really tap into what they're interested in. And that's very easy to do. You've seen it happen on a number of platforms, but you have to be much more intentional. A guy's not gonna be thrilled about the enchilada recipe that cooks in 30 minutes. What is he gonna be thrilled about and how do you make him interested? Timing. There's nothing worse than a dead Pinterest board. Pinterest just updates all the time. If you have Pinterest and you log in, there's all these photos from the new posts and pins that you're following. But when you are active, none of your content's going to be showing. So I have the people in my Pinterest boards that I go to all the time because I know they're going to have the latest information. As an organization, that's what you want to be. You want someone to log into Pinterest and be like, you know what, I'm really curious about that. I wonder what they're doing and go to you. If you don't regularly post, it's not going to be interesting. You're going to lose people really quickly. The social media world has a very limited lifespan. So even if you're just in there repinning, at least get in there. I say at least weekly. It doesn't hurt to get on once a day and at least find something to repin. That takes a whole maybe five minutes. But you can do it however best works for you. Some people say they have an hour a week and they want to use it all on Friday and they want to just devote that time. Other people do. 15 minutes, four days a week, whatever works for you, but make sure it's intentional because it's very easy to forget. Yes? Hey, Deborah. No, um, it's great. So on time, um, let's say that you led an organization where uh, there may be a person who might be more connected to that demographic, and until the demographic shifts to where you can then really leverage that with your larger constituency, uh, it may make sense for that person to help out and deploy it through them. Um, can you share a board is the question. Mm -hmm. you know, so, that, so that maybe more than one person can help manage it? Yeah, you can absolutely share a board. There's boards where you can invite pinners to it. So you would probably create an organizational presence and then invite that person to the board or just give them the login so they can manage the organizational, whichever way you want to do it. I'll do a case study at the end of this and it's Compassion International. They have that very situation. They had people who are more connected to it. They gave them their organizational login information and they're running the boards for them right now. So I think that's a really smart way to go. And you should utilize the people that are most related to that content and can kind of build that interaction. Another thing you have to think about is ease. How complicated is it? Pinterest, organizationally speaking, is helpful for a number of reasons. And we'll talk about some of the kinds of objectives you could have. But a primary objective for a lot of people is to drive traffic back to your website, or to your blog, or to your hub of your digital life. So on Pinterest then, it should be easy to do that. They should be able to click the image, and that image should take them to the website, and they should see how the image fits in. Just the other day, I think it was Better Homes and Gardens, they had posted something, people were really excited, clicking through, and the link didn't actually take you to the page that talked about what the picture was about. It was something else. And a whole bunch of people were saying, could you just give me the link? I wanted to know about this, and now I'm here, and it's very confusing. And there was a lot of frustration on the user side. As a Pinterest person, you don't want any frustration. You want them to easily click that, end up on a page that matches exactly what they would be expecting. So make sure ease is there. ROI is return on investment. At the end of the day, you're busy. There's a lot on your plate, and there's a lot of things that are good things and can contribute to your overall goal. So how do you know if Pinterest is going to help? The main way is to have an objective, to measure that objective, and to compare it. Does that work for you? And we'll talk about how to do that. But ultimately, you need to have realistic expectations. So expectations are where you can set your objective. What is it that you hope to accomplish with Pinterest? Expectations should be realistic. I think Pinterest, again, we've talked about the demographic. But some people want to see Pinterest make them the top brand in their industry. Not really what Pinterest is for. Compassion International, which I'll show on a case study in a second, their goal was to create a community for people who are their sponsors to kind of get to talk about being a sponsor and to share information about their kid. 
I was shocked about that because I thought their primary goal would be to get new sponsors. But their primary goal is to create a community, which makes perfect sense given what Pinterest is and what social media is. It's a place for your brand community to come together, be excited, and be ambassadors because they're talking about your content. It's not a place to give a sales pitch. So their expectation is that they create conversations. I think that's very good and very realistic. There's a lot of organizations who have the expectations of some sort of deal that closes, either signing up for a newsletter or signing up for a conference or buying something. And there's a lot of ways to measure that as well. So you'd have to be able to put that into your pin and have the metrics. But one thing that you want to do is have a specified goal. So often people say, I want to have more awareness based on Pinterest. And that's really great because it makes it sound easy on my part. I'm like, yeah, I can get you more awareness. People will like your boards. But they can't calculate that into what's valuable to them. So how much awareness do you need for it to be valuable? And what is awareness? Are you satisfied with more people following your boards? Or are you wanting a certain number of pins and repins? And what is the value to you over something else, such as email blasts or putting time into Facebook or putting time into Twitter or holding in-person meetings? So this is a question that can't be answered really group-wide because it's very organizational specific. How much time do you have? What, is, what are you hoping to accomplish with Pinterest? And how are you going to measure that? How much time is a pretty easy question. Most people say no time. So I would say at least try to have 15 minutes a week after you set up your initial presence. But if you have more, great. What are you hoping to get accomplished? Again, that could be to create a brand community, which I think is really the smart way to go. I think the brands that create a place for people to be excited, for people to talk about your vision and where you're headed as a church or as a ministry or as an institution is really good because that's what social media is. It's a social space. But some people want to have some tangible measurement, signups or something. And you have to ask yourself, how do you make a signup connected with the way Pinterest works? What visual will people see that will say, yes, I'm going to click on that, and then I want to give you my information and have some sort of interaction beyond that? So have your expectations set, and then make sure it's organic. Social media cannot be too pre-programmed. That's usually a question I'm asked. Is there a way to pre-program this so that we don't have to really interact with it? You can, and it's awful, and it's not social media. Social media is about the interaction. It's like saying, could I just write down everything I'm going to say to my spouse for the next 30 days and just hand them a note every time they talk to me? That just doesn't work. It's just very weird. Social media that's pre-programmed looks very weird. For example, when we had the Boston bombing, if you watch social media, and it's kind of a hard day to watch social media, I, I understand that. But from a PR standpoint, there are a lot of people who left their pre-programmed information in there. So the Boston bombing's going on, and brands are getting bashed for what they're posting, because no one thought to check in and stop the pre-programmed information. Social media is about that organic flow. It's about the conversation. It's about what's relevant and new and interacting. So really, to be robust on Pinterest, especially because it's 70% user-generated content, you want to be organic. You don't want to be programmed. Yes? Um, one of the things you said is that it's, it's people don't comment on things. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. It builds community in the sense that you can start measuring your pins, and a lot of pins will have some sort of way back to you. So for compassion, and I'll show some boards, but they'll have a pin such as, here's a child who needs a sponsorship. And when people repin that, they start seeing that go out. Or more likely, more brand oriented and brand community is, here's what I did to display my child's letters that they wrote to me. And this person had posted all of the letters that they'd gotten in different picture frames and done a collage on their wall. So it became something that's home decoration, something that's near and dear to their heart, and they posted it. And then everyone else started posting it who's a compassion type person saying, this is a great idea. I should do that. And they would post it, and then their community. So they started rallying around the visual rather than the text. And you'll see just the little text that people tend to put in when they the original poster, the original pin, a lot of people just leave that when they repin it. So you'll see the same text, but it carries the same message. So it's, it's around a visual and it's around a concept more than it is around the written word. Does that kind of answer it? OK. Analytics, ROI, always good. I won't 
for too many of you, I am a numbers person. I love graphs and charts and anything to do with Excel. But one of the things that Pinterest rolled out recently was their integrated analytics system, which is huge. Up until, I guess it was March 12th, if I'm correct, that it rolled out, you had to use third-party ways of trying to measure what's going on with your Pinterest boards. Now you don't. You can actually get the same kind of analytics you would have with your Google Analytics. So you can see which pins are most interesting to your brand community, which ones are getting repinned, and then which ones of those repins are being repinned by other people. So you can have a very clear understanding of what your brand community likes to talk about, what's relevant, and how it's driving traffic either back to your site or to your Pinterest board. You can measure how many people are starting to like your whole boards or a specific board. It's very helpful, and I think the misnomer is that you can't really measure social media. That's going out the window, but especially because Pinterest is new. It's the baby of social medias. People just kind of put things out there and they think it's going well. Metrics now help, and when you do a business page, you get the metrics. So you have to verify it because it measures it through your website and through Pinterest. So if you have a website, you want to install the pin button so people can be on your site, they see the great graphic you created, and they think, that's perfect, I'm going to pin it. They'll click your button that you installed and it pins it to their board and then it starts measuring in the analytics. So there's a couple components. One, you need to have a business page on Pinterest. Two, you want to make sure that you verify it. You can't just have it and set up and it automatically starts. They want to make sure that the person who says they own the Pinterest and says they own the website interact so that it kind of protects your privacy. Three, you need to actually use it. So many people I know have signed up for different analytics systems and they have everything, but they've never gone in there and checked, so they don't know what's working. This is the best way to tell who your brand community is and what they like. So get on those analytics to be able to measure that ROI. And it's fairly simple. Once you establish your objective and what you said you wanted to happen, and you look at the metrics, you can tell if it's working or if it's not working. So we're gonna recap what all these things mean. Then we're going to go in and look at a case study and kind of have some takeaways and then just a Q&A session of people saying, here's where I'm at, here's what my board is, here's our strategy, how could this work? So first takeaway, visuals. Really, really important to Pinterest. You cannot do Pinterest without strong visuals. You need at average, like a good size to look at is 600 pixels wide. That's a good Pinterest image. It has to be at least 100 by 200 pixels. Some people make really small images and they don't understand why it can't be pinned. But if you are working in conjunction with your website and you're making great graphics that are 600 pixels wide, then when they have that pin it button and people go, it'll look beautiful on their Pinterest site and it'll really carry that visual feeling you want. People have a feeling when they see your visuals and you want it to be good because that's what they're going to want to share and then their friends are going to want to share that and it'll just carry. It's social media. This is about starting a conversation. This is about talking with people. This is about feeding into the people that make your ministry or your institution or your organization what it is. Some people are not interested in a conversation. I've talked with different organizations and they say, you know what, we really don't care what the people think. I think, like, okay, good. Well, at least we're all on the same page and social media is probably not for you. Because social media is about that. It's all about people having a voice. As a user, that's what they like. They're talking about their opinions, their perspectives, their brands, their likes, their passions. So if you are coming in as an organization, you're not the native to social media. Natives to social media are individual users. Organizations have come in kind of as a foreigner and saying, we're here. No one wants to be marketed to in social media. No one wants to have a sales pitch in their face. So you come in and realize it's about a party. It's about feeding into what people are already excited about. You're going on and joining a conversation that is there. It's already taking place. It's already having people contribute. And you're simply joining it. So how do you make that happen? And how do you contribute in a meaningful way? Yes? Sorry, just to back up on uh, the uh, pixel size on the images, you're saying, you know, going for a larger image, 600 pixels. Yeah. On uh, the sites that I work with, generally the image is going to be three to 350 pixels that you would put on a blog post or something of that nature so that it fits nicely as kind of justified right content wraps around Absolutely. It. So um, I get the point, larger image. So like in WordPress, you upload a larger image. Uh, it can compress down to a medium size. It could be like 300 pixels. Yeah. When you click Pinterest, it, does it because uh, I'm kind of new to this, does it uh, give you the option to select 
the linked image, you know, because it's like if you click the image, it'll go to a larger image. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. So we'll select the larger image and that, or do you do two options or what? I believe it'll go straight to the larger image, straight okay. to the exact URL that it'll pull in. Okay. Yeah. So then that's how people are getting the larger image yet not using the larger image in a blog post? That is, people actually mix the larger images. A lot of them aren't the 600 pixels. So the 600 pixels might be something people uniquely designed specifically for Pinterest, and they'll run it all the way across the top mm -hmm. of the blog. And then the other ones, they'll keep the same size, even without compressing it down, they'll just put it in. And people may choose to do smaller, but they'll purposely design that top one mm -hmm. just I for Pinterest. Yeah. And then they'll go from there. Good. Yeah. Great question. Other questions on this? Yeah. For a large organization, um, what have you seen when like different parts of the organization have separate Pinterest oh. accounts, or should it be boards? So, for example, Viola has a great Pinterest account. They have some great boards and things like that. Um, and I am in charge of the Viola Fund, so raising money for student scholarships. What have you seen in things like that? Is it something where you come alongside what Viola is already doing, or you develop your own board, or you work with the alumni, where are they now board? Yeah. Because you don't, like, you want to work with what's going well already, and you don't want to say everybody, because, right. you know, like, Viola might have, you know, 25 Twitter accounts, but people are really following, like, the main one, you yeah. know, or the president, or something like that. So, what are your, what's your experience with it's a great point. There's a lot of different philosophies that go into it. Some people really feel like the diversification helps you segment your audience and reach them better. I think with the way social media works with searchability, it's better to keep it unified and do a board or something under it because you can do several boards and you can manage those and relate to those. But when people are going to Pinterest, when they're going to Twitter, when they're going anywhere, they're typing in Biola University. They're not going to be typing in the specifics generally. And you can get just as much traction with that then. And if your board starts getting a lot of traction, it'll gain just as much visibility. It doesn't need to be its own separate business account. And then you capitalize on the audience that's there. You feed into the overall structure because you are a specific part of it, but you're also part of the whole Biola brand. People are excited about that. So it's the perfect unison, I think. So I generally encourage brands to try to have a unified presence and then diversify within it. So don't have multiple Facebooks, don't have multiple Pinterest, don't have multiple Twitters, because it gets confusing, especially when you have people that are in multiple audiences. They don't know who to follow or where to go for information. So can you have uh, one person have like access and administration to one board? It would be administration to the whole account, or what you could do is have that administrator of the whole account share that board with an individual user. So if you wanted to not have the whole account, they could give you access to pin on that board to you as an individual, and then you can pin to the Biola specific board or boards that you want, but you wouldn't be doing it as the Biola board. Yeah, good question. Other questions? I have a ton, but I have to figure out this way till the end. Okay, cool. They're more like strategies. Perfect, we'll, we'll get to them for sure. So this is another takeaway. Organization versus unorganization. Be organized on Pinterest. It's so hard for people to scroll and scroll and scroll and try to figure out where they're going to find the information that you're talking about. In fact, it's so hard that people just don't do it. If it's not organized, they're not going to follow. So you have Einstein's office versus some very snazzy Apple office, apparently. With your boards, try to have an order to them. Try to have a purpose behind each one and know what content it is. Don't create a board that's going to have three pictures to it. That doesn't really make sense. So if you do a ton of events, and there's not a lot of activity in each event, maybe you have an events board instead of a board for every single individual event. Some groups have reoccurring events. So if, like the journalism department where I work, we have experienced journalism, we have our journalism student banquet, we have PRSSA, we have lots of different groups that have reoccurring. I would probably create a board for each reoccurring event so you could add to it and feed into it throughout the year but I would have one board for graduating seniors. I wouldn't do seniors 2013, 2014, 2015. It just wouldn't make sense. There's just not enough content. I'd make it one. And you want to measure everything, every pin, every image, every objective you want to measure because you will ultimately have to find a way to justify putting time into Pinterest. Time is a rare commodity. It's hard. We all have a ton on our plates and you're going to have to know why Pinterest is worth it. For some groups, it probably isn't worth it. I mean, 
That pains me to say because I love Pinterest, but it honestly won't be worth it for everyone. You have to look at your objectives and what other social media sites you're on, plus everything else you do to actually be the amazing organization you are beyond social media. So you want to measure to know if it's a value and to know what works. So let me walk you through compassion. They're a study I did for a presentation I'm doing later this fall, and they're really unique. I think they do a great job of showing what you can do as a ministry or an organization. There are other groups we could look at. We could look at Better Homes and Gardens. We could look at Nordstrom's. Those are some of the top boards. But I think in this context, it makes sense to look at Pinterest with compassion. Their goal, if you remember me saying earlier, was to create the community for people that are already ambassadors for them. They're not trying to sell anything. They're not trying to necessarily get sponsorships, though that sometimes happens for them because of this. Their primary goal is just to let people talk about compassion. So they have sponsor child, and on those, those are the pictures of kids who still need sponsorships. Letter writing ideas, four new sponsors, gift ideas. They have so many boards, so I just did those. What you can tell already is they kind of have a purpose behind the board. If I'm new to compassion and I am a mom, I just signed up, we got our first kid for the family, and I come because I'm on Pinterest because I'm 24 to 35 years old, and I look, oh, hey, there's a whole board for new sponsors. And I can go in there and find out all the details I want. And it's pictures. So that first one is a welcome. And if you click it, it's very easy to see that it says welcome. You'll go to a video of the president of the organization welcoming you as a new sponsor. Letter writing ideas has all of the ideas from other sponsors, not just compassion. So you can already see how the fabric of their brand community is weaving in. It's not compassion saying, here's how you donate, and here's how this works, and here's how this, it's here's the heartbeat of our organization, and we're about you. If you scroll down more, which I can't because it's a PowerPoint, but there is a board that says, our gratitude, thank you. And so it's an opportunity for compassion to just be like, we're such huge fans of you. You are doing great things, let us talk about it. Um, you can see that they had, at this point, 40 boards. They have a lot of followers. The interesting thing to me is I did this whole study on them. I compared them to some corporate, all of these things, and thought, wow, I cannot wait to interview them and talk to them about their strategy, because this is going to be awesome. And I did, and I found out it is awesome, just different than I thought. They have some volunteers running their board, at least they did when I talked to them, because these people were passionate. One of them was an employee of Compassion that was, I think, doing this on her additional time and then some additional people who were just volunteers saying, we love Compassion, we like Pinterest, we're on it, can we start it? So it goes back to your question, does it feed in when you have someone who's more apt to be in that demographic? Absolutely, it worked for Compassion. And they just started going. They've incredible growth, incredible growth. I think they had about 12% a month for a little while, just each month adding more users. They have had sponsorships result because of this. Again, that's not their purpose, but that's a great return on investment. And overall, they have a ton of people just talking about what Compassion is. They have so many repins. This is one of their most popular boards. It's their letter writing. So you can see the different kind of people who are posting to it. It's not all from Compassion. And the visuals kind of draw you in right away. It talks about, here's what I did with my Compassion child. Here's how I write a letter. Here's things you can include. All of those are really important, and they just speak to what the essence of being involved in Compassion is. So a good question for any organization, any group, is what is the essence of people who are involved with us? What does that mean, and how do they share that? How do they get excited? This is the bottom of their website, and I just wanted to point out they have Pinterest integrated on their homepage. It's not front and center. A lot of groups I found are kind of uncomfortable. They don't want the social media cluttering the top. I like it at the top, but I'm a social media junkie. But they at least have it present. So anytime a new image, a new initiative, a new blog post is up, someone could directly pin what's associated with that. And on their blog, which is where a majority of their stuff comes from, they have the pin it button right there. And that's what would pull in the image and eventually link it back to the blog. So the title of this session was Double Your Engagement, and I was really hoping that no one was in like the multi-million number of followers yet because that's really hard to double. But I think there are some very tangible ways because Pinterest is very new. So to double engagement, you really want to have boards that make sense and relate to your users. A lot of times, it's very interesting to go to an organization and ask them what they want to talk about 
and then reframe the question and ask them what the brand community is talking about, what their users would care about. So when you create a board, think about what makes people talk about your company. Think about what makes them excited. And then try to put that in some broad categories so people can participate in that conversation. You want to create pinnable content. That's the kind of graphics that catch attention. It uses large text so people can easily see it. If you've been on Pinterest and you're skimming down, you see how many graphics there are. You need ones that snap. And so you don't want to just haphazardly do it. A lot of people ask me if they can just repurpose things. You can. I mean, I guess some presence is better than none. But ideally, you're going to create at least a couple graphics uniquely designed for someone who's using Pinterest to stand out. And you want to interact with others. This is social media. So you should find out who the influences are. If I were doing something at Biola, I would definitely want to follow top alumni, the main faces, so maybe Dr. Barry Corey or Dr. Dave Nightstrom, because those are influencers within this brand community. I would find students who are really active and follow them. If I were a church, I would find the main people who are involved in the parts of the church life and follow them. I would talk about it. I would have the area so people could plug in. There's just so many ways to find out who to follow. So there's really no reason not to follow people. So many organizations, when they're starting out, they're very focused on creating content, building their profile. They forget that it's a conversation. So follow people and then repin their content. There's nothing better, there's no way to make someone excited than to have someone who's a huge fan of you. They love your organization, they love what you're about, and you just repinned their pin. They're so thrilled. I remember when I pinned something and Compassion actually responded, I thought, wow, that is amazing. I was so excited. And you know, I'm a nerd. I know that it's very easy to track and they can repin so many, but I felt special. I felt seen. And that's what you want your brand community to feel. You want them to feel like you see them, that you want to interact with them. You can create group boards. So perhaps you have a couple key influencers and you create a board around a topic and you invite them to participate so they can pin content. At the bottom of Compassion's board is one that's created for nonprofits. I think it's Join Us and Giving Back. And it wasn't even Compassion's board, but it shows up there because they accepted the invitation. And it's a whole bunch of nonprofits that are pinning content about giving back because of being a nonprofit. So what kind of board could you create that contributes, that lets other people contribute, that gets this excitement flowing? That's how you can double engagement. So it's all about the images. This is an infographic. The guy's Twitter handle is up there at the top. But images are big. This one would catch attention because if you put it on a Pinterest board, it's broad enough that I can tell what it's about. And it's actually the start to an infographic. So all the way down, there was tons of other information, lots of images, lots of details. But the top, the part that could be pinned, is easy to see. Here's another one. I had to go food because food is big on Pinterest. But you can tell that these people designed this for Pinterest. It's uniquely made, so you can see 15 amazing peanut butter recipes, and then their brand, fairly small. Everyone's going to know what it's about, but it still catches your eye. It's not just text. It's kind of small in the terms of Pinterest, but it works. I knew what it was. I was actually looking for gluten-free recipes to see if I could find the one to share with you. And this stood out, and I thought, that's a great point. It's not too much about their brand. It's more about the content, more about what they're contributing. And what's your ROI? So this session, double your engagement, measure your ROI. That goes back to what your objectives are. So again, are you looking at how many people come to your website? Are you looking at how many people take an action? Are you looking at how many people follow overall your organization or specific boards or how many repins you have? I have suggestions. I think it's a great idea to make it about the brand community, to make it about people pinning and repinning. But if you have other bottom line things, just know how you're going to measure it, because you absolutely can. And you need to associate that objective with a value. So if you say, great, we got 100 new followers, what does that actually mean? What is the value to you? How are you going to equate that? There's a number of ways different organizations can do this. Sometimes they equate it with the cost of a name. Probably a little less than the actual cost of a name, because when you purchase names to be able to do fundraising development through, you can put a value on the lifetime of that donor. Well, you're getting some sort of interaction here, so maybe you can associate half the cost of a name with it, because at least it's the start of a relationship. Or depending on how your organization works, some other number. But you want to give it some value. 
because it doesn't really translate well to say we have 100 new followers when you're trying to show the ROI of what you just spent all this time doing. Really, the, the value of ROI is to give credibility to social media and value to your efforts on behalf of your organization. So put a dollar sign with it. And I can talk specifics in the Q&A if you're saying, this is what we're going for. How can you measure that? There's a lot of different ways to assign an actual value to an objective. Set reasonable expectations. I was working with a group, and their goal was to increase by 100% in the next two weeks. I thought that, I mean, that's great if you have zero, because you can easily do that. But if you're actually setting something that's not reasonable. You're setting yourself up to fail, right? So you want to have something that feeds into a reasonable expectation. Have tangible expectations on the amount of time you can invest, on the amount of interaction you expect, and the amount of information you have. If you have not been very active in a brand community, you're probably not really aware right now what they want to talk about, what they're going to repin, how they're going to interact, and what that means for your company. So you need to have at least a little margin in there built in for you to do research so you can say, this is a reasonable expectation for us based on this information about our demographic or our competitors or what we're expecting or what we've seen on Facebook and Twitter, so we would expect this. And then you monitor. I would strongly, strongly recommend using Twitter's tool or <laughs> Pinterest's tool because they rolled it out and it's integrated with their system. But there's also a lot of third-party tools that I would probably use in conjunction. Because if you're doing social media, if you're on Pinterest, my guess is you're also already on Facebook and Twitter because those are kind of the dominant ones. So you want some tool that can do a comparative analysis that can kind of integrate those and can show it in relation to your website. All of that is important. It's good to know what's happening on Pinterest and put that in perspective, but you can only do it when you know what's happening everywhere. So we're going to do three more slides, I promise. We'll get through all this content, and then the Q&A. At the beginning, we had the three groups. We had phase one, phase two, phase three. So kind of newbies, comfortable, or experts. So here's some takeaway. If you are a newbie, you need to establish a goal for Pinterest, and a goal like we talked about with a tangible number and a tangible price associated with that. And select four to six boards you're going to make for your organization. I think that's a good start. And these boards should be broad categories of things that your user community, your brand community, is going to be excited about, going to want to talk about, going to share. You want to design pinnable content and integrate pins onto your site, your blog, and your other networks. So if you're on Pinterest, I should be able to tell that when I go to your website. I should know about it when I'm on your Facebook, and I should see it on your Twitter as well. It should be all together. And pinnable content. Not everything is going to be designed for Pinterest. That's unrealistic. But maybe one thing every two weeks or every month, you could start out with a goal of, hey, let's make this specifically to catch the eye of people who are on Pinterest and see where it goes. Generally speaking, if you make something for a visual medium and you're using it in other platforms, it's going to go really well. No one's going to be like, oh my goodness, you created a great visual and I did not need to see that. That's just not their reaction. So it's going to benefit your other content, but it just requires a little more intentionality. You want to follow those influencers and people who might be interested in your topic. You are joining Pinterest and there's a conversation happening. It's already happening in social media and it's around the topic of who you are. The question I'm normally asked is, well, we've, we've searched for our name and no one's talking about it. You need to think broad, think generic terms. What is the generic term for what you do? And those are the people who are going to be talking about the content. So is it education? Is it ministry? Is it Christian living? Is it intellectual development? Is it giving back? Is it doing good? What are the broad concepts that you could be part of? And then you want to set up a content calendar to regularly post at least once for every six weeks. Give it a chance to take off. Again, social media is about showing up. It's about being there. It's about that conversation. So a lot of people will leave something like this super excited, kind of like Michael Hyatt was saying with the blogs, go out there, and then it just dies. So at least make a plan to set aside 15 minutes on a Wednesday and post, or 15 minutes on a Friday, sometime that works for you, for six weeks and see where you're at. OK. If you're not a newbie, you feel like that's you know, easy. You've got it. Maybe you're in the cushion phase. And that's you know pretty comfortable with Pinterest. You've been seeing what they're rolling out. You like it. So put metrics on your goal. Put tangible numbers that you're looking for in their new system. If you don't have their system integrated, make that one of your goals so that you can measure pins, repins, and repins of repins and reach. 
and you want to look at your current content. Because if you're already at this phase, you should have multiple boards. Which boards work for you and which don't? Now, you can follow either philosophy. You can delete boards that aren't working. My suggestion would be probably leave them alone, because at least you have followers. But focus in on what is working, and use that to create your content that you're going to then generate. What is your least pinnable content? It's never fun to look at what's not working, but I think it's helpful. So look through your analytics. What thing did you put out there, and it just flopped? No one was interested in. And can you see a pattern? Are there several of those? And what is your most interesting content? You want to design board experiences through multi-tiered pinning. So this is the idea of maybe you're putting five pictures up at once on a board, and it's designed to kind of give a whole experience. So I saw this with a car board. And what they did is they had their card, but then around it, they had different landscape scenes. So yeah, it was going to different things, but the overall visual presence was, wow, that's interesting because it's in context. You see cars, they're out on the road, that's beautiful landscape, this is a car I want, absolutely. So what could you do that would create an overall experience? What are multiple pictures that come together to share something your brand community would be about and put those all up at once on a board to create that? And then identify your brand community influencers and highlight them. This could be an invitation to start pinning to an exclusive board. It could be you going onto their boards and repinning or commenting on content, because it does happen rarely. But when it does, people kind of get excited, like, wow, they wrote something. What can you do to highlight the people who are big influencers? Make them even more enthusiastic for who you are, because you're paying attention to them. And then Pin Pro. If you are past those and you are ready, Make sure all your pins are rich pins. So rich pins were recently rolled out by Pinterest, and it's the idea that you can put in coding all of this information that relates back to a pin, usually used for a bottom line ROI closing deal type of product. So you are going to put in a description of what you're trying to do. So maybe it's a newsletter sign up, maybe it's a conference registration, maybe it's a product. And you are going to put in a price, you are going to put in a destination URL, you are going to put in all sorts of other details that you can see in the coding, and it constantly monitors it. These rich pins give users a lot of information all at once. When people are on Pinterest, if you are in the retail business, they have found greater selling power to people there because they're looking. They want to be informed by their friends about what's working, and they kind of are window shopping from their home. So these rich pins allow people to have additional information that you wouldn't have otherwise, and they're what people are using from an organizational standpoint to really narrow in on monitoring. You want to design content specifically for Pinterest with intended user paths. So we talked about making pinnable images, but what would happen if you decided that once every month your homepage image is going to be uniquely made, hoping people use it on Pinterest. It's designed just for Pinterest. If other people use it, great, but it's made for Pinterest and you put it front and center. What happens if you send out an email with something that says, pin me, and that's used? All of these different things. How can you make purposeful content for Pinterest? Not just repurposing, but purposeful just for Pinterest. You want to monitor pins and metrics to evaluate best content strategy. At this point, if you are a pin pro, you should know which boards are not good. You should know which content is not working. What you're now looking at is which has the potential to go viral. Which has the potential to be that thing that everyone's sharing? How many of you have seen the It's Not the Nail video? Oh, OK, good. Um, I, I would show it to you, except I don't have it all linked up here. It, it's going viral right now, and it's classic. It's great. It's all about a guy trying to fix problems, and the girl saying, don't fix a problem. Just listen to me, and she has a nail in her head. And the image yeah. is the two sitting there and the nail coming out of her head. And it is, it's going everywhere right now because it's so funny. And people are pinning and pinning and sharing on Facebook and tweeting it. That image captures a lot. What kind of content, after looking at your metrics, has the potential to do that for you? What can go viral because it's funny, because it's informative, because it makes people excited? You want to integrate Pinterest into an offline experience. If you're at this level, again, you probably have a more robust digital strategy. And one of the things I always encourage people to do is realize it's not social media over here and real world over here. These two things should interact. So there's ways that you can bring Pinterest into the offline world. You might have infographics. And this is something that I, once I get more time, which I'm sure is what you all think too, is 
something I want to bring into my classes. I would love to be sitting in class and at the end of the lecture say, great, there is an infographic on today's lecture. If you just want to get it downloaded from Pinterest, feel free. That would be a great way to bring offline and online experience together. If you have an event and there's a lot of information you want to give to people afterwards or before, instead of printing out packets, how much better to say there's a Pinterest board with everything you would need and do the categories on that board. And you could give them a QR code that could easily take them there. There are a lot of ways that you can use Pinterest to connect the online and offline experience. And because it can link to video, because it can link to content and can link to photos, what a great opportunity to kind of make that convergence of media. And then you want to engage the brand, engage the brand community with user gratification. One of the main theories and ideas that people are talking about with social media right now is why in the world are people using social media? And the question really comes back to a lot of different ways of looking at it. Some is identity construction. So that's one thing that's important to you as really cause-driven organizations, whether that's edu <laughs> education or a ministry, there's a cause behind what you're doing. And causes tend to contribute to the way someone views themselves. Social media, people have been saying, is it, does it give them a chance to present themselves falsely or more authentically? One study I tend to really like is that it gives people to the opportunity to present themselves in an authentic way, but slightly better than they are, something they hope to be. And that's an interesting perspective to me, especially because I was with a high school youth group and that was not what I was seeing. But if you look at Pinterest and you look at your boards and you're saying, what's altruistic? What do people want to be about? What would they like to share? That can give you some insight into what they're doing. But another area is users' gratification. What makes them feel really excited? What's an exchange? What is gratifying to them specifically about repinning an image? And usually it's about whether they can be repinned, whether it contributes to something they're doing, whether it reflects an accomplishment or something they've already done, whether it's looking forward to something they will be doing. Those kind of things contribute back to who they are as a person, make them gratified to share it, and will most likely lead to greater engagement, which just makes sense, right? If it's something that either contributes to who you are or you like, you'll participate. And if it's something that's boring or has no relation to you, you're not going to do much with. But that's really the question you want to start asking. What gratifies our community? Something I didn't put on here that I'm really interested in is this idea of stewardship as well. There's a concept within public relations of stewardship, and it's not, not the Christian concept that we think about, but it's the concept of the trust people place in you as an organization. How do you steward that in such a way that you display gratitude for their trust? And that can be in a corporate brand, but it is especially true, I think, in institutions that deal with faith, that deal with causes, that deal with influences on life. And so sometimes, and I think Pinterest is a great place to do it, it's your opportunity to brag on the community and to show what you're doing. So you could have a board about giving back, or if you're in education, students who are excelling, or initiatives to really help people who don't have the advantage. If you are in a ministry, maybe it's the share day that you do at your church and everyone's out there in the community and it's just about you giving back, you contributing to the good, you being beneficial. And another board that's all about thank yous. Maybe pictures of the people who participated with a special call out thank you to them or different opportunities. Whatever it is, it's your opportunity to, in this public relations standpoint, steward the trust given to you by your brand community saying, we believe in you, we think you're a good organization, I want to participate personally with you and share my life with you, so let me pin your content. It's your opportunity to feed back into that. All right, so I left a fair amount of time for questions because Pinterest is unique, it's new, and everyone kind of has a different take. So this is a great opportunity to kind of dive in. I'll just ask one and then give other people a chance, okay. and then I'll ask another one. Um, so my first question is just about repinning etiquette. And I know there's a lot of pins out there that'll have like, a compelling image but then link to something that has nothing to do with that image or there will be pins where you'll you'll repin someone else's um, image and link but then you'll change the, the text or you can even change the link like just I'm wondering as a professional business what is the etiquette that we take like we should take in repinning Thanks. It's a great question. Um, a lot of times people will still give credit to the original pinner within the text with the at and their, their handle, but it's very appropriate to rewrite text however you'd like. 
it's usually assumed that you'll leave the link alone, though you're right, you can change the link. Generally, professionally, you leave it because people are tracking that and it, it's feeding into it. And it sometimes helps, especially if it's feeding into one of your brand community's blog posts or something like that. I would be very leery of repinning anything that has a great image but takes you to somewhere that's not associated. I just avoid those, almost like spam. It's usually not intended, but I don't repin it because when you repin, you're giving your vouch of endorsement for it, so then that reflects on you. And then also just like, in terms of owning the image that we pin, mm. like, I mean, for instance, in marketing, it's like, well, we're gonna buy a stock photo if we're gonna use something that we didn't create ourselves, but in Pinterest, it's kind of like a little bit more loosely <laughs> yeah, judged. It's very loosely. So, yeah. yeah, this is a copyright issue, which is huge with Pinterest right now, especially organizationally, because you're, you're sharing images. So there's a couple ways to look at it. One, legally, Oftentimes that image is actually not housed with you, it's housed somewhere else. And so from my understanding currently and latest standards with Pinterest is you're not responsible if it was copyright infringement because you've repinned from someone else, you're not endorsing it, it's simply a repin and it shows that. If you are using content and it's the original pin, you definitely wanna make sure that it's not a copyright infringement. I, I kind of push it to the next level. There's only so much you can do because it's really hard to track down copyright versus non-copyright. I was talking, I was at an event with Wahoo's Fish Tacos. They have a huge Pinterest board and they have this issue because they have a lot of user content that's pinned and they repin a lot of user content. And their take on it was once it's online, it's almost impossible to tell what's copyrighted. So generally they're not doing images that are copyright-esque, they are doing images if they are repinning from users that are their pictures of eating, their pictures of being on the beach, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But they try to do some tracing back if they're going to do an image that is copyrighted. So it's, it's a sticky world of social media. I'm sure it'll develop. It will. There haven't been many cases, I don't know of any case yet, of someone being copyright infringement legally on Pinterest because it does go back to a different URL and the way you track it. Ethically, for me as a Christian, I try to push it to the next level. Sometimes if you are, if it looks like an image, you can kind of tell images that look really strong. If it looks like it is, I sometimes do a Google search to see if it's housed in some database that looks like it should have been purchased. And if it's not, if they don't have a copyright thing, I might just bypass it. And you can give them shout outs in other ways. If it's a group or something, you can pin your own content, but link to them or something like that. And there are also like pins sometimes, like for instance, there, it's really popular to pin like visual quotes. Mm -hmm. So, but like those might ne not necessarily link to anywhere. Like, is there still value in pinning images that don't link? <laughs> There's value in that you might get repins. Right. There's not value if, you're, if your objective is to bring it back to your organization. Right, right. But there's always value in sharing and contributing to the content. Right, and just building kind of a portfolio of like having interesting things on your Pinterest mm -hmm. boards and stuff. And you might even, I mean a lot of people will click to see if it goes somewhere. So you might create a blog or something that talks about inspiration or, or something that could be a broad catch-all for some of those that would go back or sharing an inspirational story about someone and, and then highlighting them, but then having those blogs, just so it goes somewhere. You really, you wanna avoid as much as possible having pins that don't have links, but I mean, there are times. Something's good, you have your 15 minutes on Friday, the 15 minutes is done, you could repin it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you decide, so say you have an event and you want to share the content from the event, say the pictures of folks who are there and a presentation or information Typically, you would just send people to an event link on the website or something like that. What yeah. determines um, your decision in saying, you know what, we're going to make a Pinterest board for this event? Is it the age group that, that the event was typically 24 to 35 year old women? Or what determines that decision? I think it, it goes back into your overall social strategy. So usually that decision is determined by the end objective. So if you have those three parts, what's the best way to make sure you're users go from an offline experience to taking an online action. But usually you're gonna find parts of it in every sphere. So you might put up a album on Facebook and also have that same album on Pinterest because they're gonna be different users. And 
I probably wouldn't do as much donation on there just because it's not the platform. The age group will contribute, but usually it's going to relate to your overall objective of a digital strategy beyond just Pinterest. What at the end of the day is the primary thing that your organization thinks is most important? And which out of those tools, because social media is essentially a tool, which tool is best used to accomplish that? And then which parts of those tools? And you would divvy out, pictures are gonna go here, a recap video is gonna go here, and then we'll do this. Compassion, for example, their digital strategy, at least for social media, hubs around their blog. So anything on any of their social media outlets will always link back to their blog in some way or another, and they create content specifically for the platform, so they'll make an image for Pinterest but it goes back to a blog recap and a link to donate. Or they will put something on Twitter, but it will be just one of the standout quotes that's in that blog. And so that's because they want people at their blog. For you, you'd have to know which one is most important, though. Okay. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just like kind of curious of like how far to deviate from what your actual organization is about. Like for instance, I would be creating a Pinterest um, account on behalf of like a homeschool program. So deviating as far as like, oh, and, and here's recipes to cook at home and here's stuff to design. Like, you know, that's not necessarily education in the home, but just yeah. you know, like how do you kind of navigate? Yeah, there's, there's a theory behind organizational use of social media in that you are giving your brand a personality. People are kind of attaching to you like you're a person, so they're going to want to see different facets. You don't want to be too off-skewed, but you would want to do, I mean, let's face it, Pinterest recipes, they go together. So maybe you would do great lunches for in-between lessons, right. and it could be lunches you could have in 30 minutes, something like that. Right. And then that kind of relates, but it still feeds into that platform. So you would really want to try to find that. Yeah, and it kind of relates. People often ask me, can they use humor? Or what kind of voice should they use on social media? And you want to use a voice that's very relational, very different than blogging, than a company newsletter. Because social media, people feel connected. It's that parasocial connection. All of a sudden, because they're following you on Pinterest, or Facebook, or Twitter, you are their friend. They feel deeply connected. And so you want to use language that displays that. You want to use boards that display that. You want to use interactions that model more interpersonal rather than mass public. Um, and my company actually works a lot with homeschoolers. And we have a Pinterest page. And what we do is brain food. So it's nice. you know, food yeah. to help with studying or like graduation party ideas, so graduation like party food, yeah. kind of obscure things that you can still pull in. Pull it in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can just be creative and kind of cheesy with it, but it still works. <laughs> mm -hmm. How many of you guys have organizational Pinterest pages, not profiles? OK. And do you guys use rich pins and the integration of engagement yet? You do? Oh, um, yeah. Bit, yeah, with analytics, not so much rich pins, just because I've been busy lately and haven't been able to do that. Yeah. Um, but a lot Great. Yeah. But I was, I'm oh, sorry, what, uh, I was going to ask like what some of the, the differences are, because I'm not familiar with the business boards yet or the business page. And like, does that create limitations in the same way that like Facebook no. pages do? Thank goodness, not yet. Okay. It gives you more flexibility right now, because you can use rich pins. You can use the analytics. Those aren't things that are really user generated right now. So not really limiting. Us. No. <laughs> Pinterest is much friendlier than Facebook, yeah. I think, when you go in that route. Yeah, so, so that's a question I have. So, um, you know, you know, what is a business? I mean, that that's a challenge because we have organizations, that, and I'm sure that an NGO would be a business, okay? Mm. But I mean, but then there's people that are that have personal brands that you know that crosses the line between what is somehow partly personal and what really is a viable movement that you're working on. Yeah. So um so the thing is that um yeah what's some of the etiquette around that and also, you know, I, I that's that's I think one question around that is and, and I'll probably come back to another question in that's somewhat related, but um what do you suggest about that kind of thing where someone either has a public persona or a type of figure and or um, you know, like we we're talking about before, multitask in a way that they also work at organization. You know yeah. Typically when there's a persona involved, I encourage them to do a persona and make it a business page because the functions of business things 
any profile, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, is that it gives you the tools that you'll want to measure and report, which you usually want even if you're a public persona. So for me, when I've done that, I've switched most of my things to a public one so I can analyze, so I can report, and then I will pull in, when I'm doing things with organizational, I can create a board around that if I want, or I can launch an additional site for them if I need to. But the social capital you will gain as a public figure, you will want to have your name out there, but you'll also want the tools that they give with businesses. And because as a public figure, you qualify as that, you can merge those two really well, I think. And it, it doesn't change the presentation much. So people aren't going to get there and be like, oh, you are a company. It's just going to give you the back end tools to say, OK, this is what's working. Here's who I'm reaching. And I usually still have just I do less personal now on there just because there is so much public and I'm becoming more and more aware of what's being collected. But at the same time, I will have a board that's more my life because part of being a public figure is people know that you have a personal life and they kind of want to know a little bit about who you are. And so you kind of meld it that way. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pull up Pinterest if we're good then and show you guys some things. Yes, please ask away and I will answer while I'm pulling okay. it up. <laughs> um, I was going to ask if you know if Pinterest integrates with Google Analytics, because Google Analytics can like integrate Facebook and stuff. Yeah, uh, from what I understand, I think it, I was reading about this. I don't know how well their new system integrates. I believe it does cross-integrate. A lot of people do additional things within Google Analytics beyond the Pinterest analytics. So they're still tracking, they're creating the funnels, they're creating the goals within analytics and tying it to that URL and then using that URL for their pin to do the tracking on that end. Okay. Um, and then my last question was just kind of about dealing with competition mm -hmm. and like how that works in terms of repinning because I mean if like a competitive like homeschool program is pinning something that's relevant and we want to repin it, but then that means we're also promoting our competitor. Like, how do you kind of navigate that? The social world is a really interesting one where you could repin and it'll probably work out better for you anyway because people will see like, oh wow, you did that? I see you as an information source. One of the people I follow the most and I would recommend for all of you is Mari Smith. She's really big with Facebook, but she does information on all of these platforms. I've realized in the last couple months she does less that's original. She pulls from everyone else, but I always go to her first, even though I know everyone else she's pulling from. And that's what will happen, too, if you become a repinner of other information. So here's a Pinterest site. You can tell that by the people I follow, there are a lot of girls that apparently are interested in fashion and nails. But Pinterest, in the last little while, redid their design. So now you can click on this and you can see categories that you're able to search under a broad category. So I can look at that beyond just my friends. That's important for you as you think about strategy with your boards. I said come up with categories. You should look at these categories to be thinking how can you capitalize on that? How can you get into something there? Because this gives you the words you want to use for board names, for the text on a picture, even for the hyperlink. So for example, we have a lot of education, it sounds like. So I could click on education. And here's what you're seeing pulled up. Now the interesting thing I find about a lot of groups that are coming on the scene, education is one of the ones coming on the scene, ministries are coming on the scene, there are a lot of new groups getting on Pinterest. But as I scan these images, I'm not necessarily compelled to click on any of them because I don't know what they're about. And that's what pinnable content is. If I were to scroll down, which is what I usually do, this one starts standing out because at least I can see a little bit of something. But most likely, I'm going to click on a piece of content that tells me what it is before I click on it. That's the great thing about the recipes is you usually can see what you're getting. So if you're not in something that's a recipe-driven area, you're going to want to have content. This managing a classroom. They melded together the visual and the graphic. If I'm interested in education, I think, oh, managing a classroom. I know what I'm going to get, and I see lots of interesting things. I will click there. And now you can see I can visit the website immediately. I can pin it. I can like it. And this is new, sending. I don't know how many of you were there when they rolled that out. But previously, you had to email your friends the pins that you thought were cool. Now you just send them, like Facebook. They kind of did that inside messaging. So these are things to keep in mind. That's one of the ways to research your competition. When you're thinking about your boards, go up to this category, 
figure out which category you generally fall in, look at it and see what other people are doing to see what's being pinned and how it's working. And then what I usually encourage people to do is look at them and see, is there any way I fit into any of these other categories? Can I make a way to fit into one of these categories so that I can engage? For example, popular, I'm sure everyone would like to be in the popular, but that's probably a pretty good place to go and see at least what's trending. Because when something trends on social media, it's something good to follow, something good to try to capitalize on. So you can see that it's a lot of exercise, a lot of design. So maybe if you're doing homeschool, you can do tips for exercising or PE class. I was homeschooled and I didn't have a PA class, but hopefully they do now. Or if you are doing something for church ministry, I know a lot of them have asked, how do we get guys onto social media? How do we reach guys? And the way you can do that is maybe you have guys going out, my dad's a pastor and they do a, <laughs> a motorcycle get together where they just all get around and drive on motorcycles for half the day. They have so much fun. You could create a board around that. You could create images and that would pull in that group. Probably more so their wives at this point because it is Pinterest. You have gift ideas around any major holiday. You're gonna start seeing things so it's for dad because obviously we have Father's Day coming up. For mom was around Mother's Day. Birthdays, so what can you capitalize on? That's where you wanna to get to Mm. Father's Day gifts by now. Like if you click on it, and it takes you to their commerce site. A ton, a ton. Seventy-five percent of Fortune 500 companies were on it, and then in the retail industry, which would be primarily there, it is the larger pusher of traffic out of Twitter, out of Facebook. Pinterest is what's driving sales, and people on Pinterest are spending more as well as driving additional sales. So for them, it's become the next big thing for that. Because for some people, like you could. Exactly, and that's the beauty behind those rich pins that they created is because you can click on the rich pin and it takes you right to the product you were looking at, but even before you click on it, it gives you all the details, the description, the price, where it's at, and everything. Because retailers, they are the most interested in Pinterest out of any organizational group right now is retail. People are looking, they are buying. This is the new window shopping. And people are more comfortable with this than walking into stores in some senses because it's a referral by friends. You're seeing your friends talk about it, therefore you feel more confident. Preparing for this, I was reading about the fact that there are now more devices connected to the internet than there are people in the world, and 40% of people will interact more online than face-to-face, because -face, they feel more comfortable. There are so many ways we could talk about that, but in light of Pinterest, that tells me people are gonna be there, because it is visual, we like images, we shop by images, we make decisions by images, so this is where people are flocking to, and that's why it's growing so quickly and becomes such a huge driver of traffic, huge driver of commerce. And that's why I think you're seeing the changes. They're not a publicly traded company right now, so it's a little different. I actually prefer that. I feel like it's more stable than Facebook, but they are starting to have the tools that people would want because there are so many businesses there. And they have a whole section. I will pull it up, actually. It's a business for Pinterest. that I would recommend for anyone who is looking at starting their business page. Their starter resource guide is not that amazing. I mean, you could download it, but it basically tells you to pin and pin smartly. But it does give you some case studies, which are interesting. We could look at them. This is a unique demographic, this room full of ministry and education. It's not quite their demographic, but when you go there, you can see what people have done, what is working, and some of their top pinners, and just interesting ways that people have decided to use boards, decided to use pins. One of the things that I think is important to always do on social media is be looking at how others have done it. There's no reason to have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great things. For example, you wouldn't necessarily think that WikiHow would have gone onto Pinterest. I mean, it, it works, but it's interesting that they have become one of the most successful I'm gonna to go to their page. And you can see why they're really well, but you can also easily pin a lot of these. This content on their homepage is so pinnable. And so they have pinnable content. They have short information. They're feeding into a brand community because communities 
typically things that have gratified users when they came up with categories. People use social media because they want to be the first to know something, because they want to be taught how to do something, because they want to share their belief systems or their knowledge, and because they want to be entertained. So those are some broad categories. And you can see how they do that. They have how to be cool. They have funny things. So humor goes far. How to goes far. Images go far. And on Pinterest, it all comes together. People have asked, well, a year ago, people were asking me if social media was going to last. Yes, social media is here to stay. We're not going to see it go. You're going to see it morph and change. And I honestly think Pinterest is the way it's going. There is less text-based mediums now. People are more interested in the image, and they're more interested in click and decide, click and decide. They don't want to go through a lot of content. So Pinterest models that, because it's just a bunch of clicking. You're not scrolling, unless you're on the home page, scrolling down. Yeah. OK, so this is not an easy question to really think through. But so, so I think that um, it's clear that there are existing relationships with content that almost any thoughtful person or organization can uh, identify that they could they could help drive content okay mm -hmm. but then you think about your native core business you know that is not okay I've got to fabricate some kind of connection but 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 a core business um, and so with with this branching off of 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 different topics I mean you know, a lot of times when we try to preemptively say, you know, like, is this app going to fly? Is it really mm. going to happen? You know, like, like there's one called Feed, P-H-E-E-D. That I think is a tremendous app. It's what Twitter should have been. But mm. I don't know if it's really going to get any wings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the thing is that you're, you, you don't want to, you can't afford time-wise to latch on to everything. I think that Pinterest, even months ago, I just knew in my heart it was going to happen. And I think it's actually going to, you know, you talk about the, the demographic right now. My guess is that it's going to continue to morph, and it, I just think mm -hmm. that inevitably it will grab large portions of both genders, and I think it will grab a large demographic even, especially of the older crowd too. Yeah. So with that in mind, the, here's my question. Um, let's say that right now you say, you know, I can see how we could drive something or, or, or move an audience towards some of this content, but it's still not the primary thing that we do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking about you, at the same time, you don't want to be late to the party yeah. because there's a sense in which we need to preemptively act in order to get the first fruits, you know? Mm -hmm. So i am just ask you, what do you think about that? Because part of the problem that you're mentioning is that to make a Pinterest site really happen, if it's static, it's dead, and it's lame, and then, you, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a sense in which while interest is building, and dynamics are building towards certain kinds of content areas that right now are non-existent or low. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest with that? Because you know it takes time to build the kind of content that you want. And at the same time, when you jump in, in a way, I think most organizations want to go large and not just sort of, you know, sort of piddle around with it. And yeah. then sort of like, oh, great, you know, got the Sears site and has a total three pins. You know, right. So, right. So, so give us a little perspective on that, just as a HR, I mean, a PR kind of person. I would say that it's a it's a complicated question for sure, but what you might want to do is, I agree, it's going to grow, it's going to be there, your audience will be there. So grab your domain name now because they're already slipping away, and then hold off and build your content. And build it for the audience that you have, for your core business things, and just start being there now. Because even if you don't have a large audience, it's going to get you there. Maybe you don't invest as much time as you will. Maybe it's not 15 minutes. Maybe you set up the platform and you post once a month just until you start seeing that change. But at least you'll be present when people come. Mm -hmm. And you can have a longer opportunity to think through your categories, to think through how am I going to do this in a strategic way that really relates to who you are. Because social media should be true to the business, not to the platform, if that makes sense. Right. And so that way, you, you have your presence, you can be strategic, you can go slowly, and then when it is valuable, it's already there. I was talking last night to someone, he's in the architectural design industry, but they support architects, they're not the architects, and their company is split over whether to get on Pinterest right now or not because it doesn't help them. They've opted not to. I think they really should be at this point because at least you're saving your spot. You have your RSVP to the party, kind of. And then, as your audience starts getting on there, they will initially search for you. 
And so if you wait till your audience is there, they've already searched and you're not present. Where if you're there when they're initially searching, you're going to be the first people that they're going to find, which is important because if you go back to Pinterest, and for those of you who aren't on it, it's not that huge a deal, but in the corner, it suggests who you should follow. So up here, when it comes up, I'm constantly getting recommendations. You should be part of this board. I was invited to pin by a group of people. I have no idea who they are. But those recommendations are really important because you want your company and your brand and your conversations to be the ones that are there. So repins from is also important. You can start building organizational relationships on social media before your audience is there. So I would, I would, I would be there. I would at least, maybe you don't have four to six boards, maybe you have two to start with. And on, on these uh, business sites, let's say that, um, like for example, we've got Biola, we've got the university, then we have Biola Youth, Biola Academic mm -hmm. under it. I mean, so you've got these multiples. Uh, is it possible, I mean, I know you can create different boards for different parts of your organization. Um, is it possible to link boards either, I'm sorry, not board, is it possible to link business accounts like two business accounts that are maybe subsidiaries or somehow related, or is it possible, if not directly through Pinterest to connect them, is it possible to connect them through an aggregator? Currently, I don't know of one that does that, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see one come out in the next couple months because business pages are so new. They haven't really created the mechanism to build them together yet, but they just came out fairly recently. I would say by the end of this year, you're going to see, if not a function within Pinterest, within an aggregator for sure. That's the hard, the hard part, but the good part. Everything that people have been saying they want is starting to come out. So the end of last year, the big thing was, why can't we measure within Pinterest? And now it's out. And the next thing was, why don't we have business pages? Why are we users? And now business is here. So it, every three to six months, you're seeing a new development that models the other business platforms. All right, so I'm going to close out with four minutes to go. The main things I want you guys to walk away with is how to double your engagement, how to measure your ROI. Measuring ROI relates, again, back to set that objective, have it tangible, and put the metrics in, either with Google Analytics, with, I think Pinterest is a great way to start because it's easy and free when you're first there. But all of that will let you know what is your return on investment. And doubling your engagement really relates back to understanding your brand community. That's the biggest thing that boards on Pinterest that are not taking off typically are not plugging into their brand community. They haven't asked what is our brand community talking about, what makes them so excited, and how do we highlight them? How do we make them the focus? And what we're about, but not us. And that's how you start that conversation and double it. I would give yourself, depending on your size, I mean, we can talk specifics after this if you want, but if you are in the 200 to 600 range, I would give yourself four months of really intentional, and I would think you could see a doubling of that. If you're over in the thousands, it kind of probably depends how many thousands you're at, but activity and growth are kind of prop proportional. So if you start reaching out to your influencers and you're very active, how many of you were with Michael Hyatt's opening session? Okay, good, you saw his growth, it starts building on it. So if you have thousands of followers, you can double that. It'll just take a little bit more engagement, but then your return is gonna be greater. If you are in the newbie stage, don't expect to be to 10,000 followers by the end of the summer, that's, that's too high a goal. But I would say you could definitely double where you're at. That's the main goal, is look where you're at and how to move forward. Thank you guys so much. My contact information is there. I am happy to give you a card. I have that as well, but email you can reach me or Carolyn make him on just about any platform, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Google Plus for anyone who does decide to use Google Plus. It's always Carolyn make him. Thank you guys. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.